where we are going to hear and see and discuss the work of our uh, Abigail, our Cohen fellow, uh, uh, Karima Ashadu, who is going to be introduced by uh, the curator, Greg De Cure. And so I'm not going to say very much more about Karima other than that um, when I saw her work for the first time, uh, I was bowled over uh, and uh, I thought it was just brilliant. It was somehow both uh, in the world and out of the world at the same time, and it had a huge impact on me. So personally, I'm really thrilled that you're at the Institute and that we're going to learn more about your work. Uh, and let me just briefly introduce the introducer. Uh, we're very lucky to have Greg De Cure with us from Belgrade, who's an independent curator, a writer and a translator. Uh, and an immensely respected uh, uh, curator of, of uh, film and visual arts um, who has done work that has been shown at the uh, curated work that's been shown at the ICA over, I think, a very interesting series for over three years from 2014 to 17. Uh, he's curated several programs on Yugoslav cinema. Uh, his uh, his uh, curations have been featured at the LA Film Forum, uh, Go East in Wiesbaden, Germany, and pretty much everywhere in between. So, uh, Greg, thank you so much for joining us, and I will hand over to you. I should just add that after the discussion, there will, as usual, uh, be uh, time for all of you to ask questions, uh, if you wish. Greg, thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate the kind introduction, Mark. And thank you also to all your colleagues at the Institute for the invitation. Thank you, Karima, also for your, your brilliant work and, and being a wonderful colleague, a, a wonderful artist. So this introduction to you, Karima, will be very quick because we want to have time, obviously, uh, at the end to discuss your work a little bit more and hopefully have even more time to, to open it up to the audience. But just to say uh, this, uh, this program that Mark mentioned that I did at ICA, this was actually the first time that I, I met Karima and the first time that I worked with her. Like all great relationships, I can't quite remember how I got in touch with her somehow. <laughs> um, it just seems like we just sort of slid into contact and, and stayed in contact and shows started opening up and opportunities started uh, formulating to where we could work on things together. I, this program that I did at ICA in London called Avant Noir, I did it in multiple segments. And I think for that first segment, as I was just researching, I probably came across your work one of two ways, either someone recommended it to me, or probably I saw something about your work at Ann Arbor Film Festival in Michigan in the United States, which is a well-respected, long-running, one of the longest-running festivals of alternative film and video in the world, uh, anywhere. And you had won some awards there. And I think that's how I sort of got in touch with you or, or got interested in your work. But anyway, when we finally connected, I was really just pleased and excited to see that you were doing something that nobody else uh, that I worked with was doing. You were sort of dealing with areas um, and, and techniques that I found and still do find to be very unique. Um, and you know, we're going to talk a little bit about, about those techniques and, and devices and aesthetics, but also of course, ideology and, and politics and everything that makes your work what it is uh, across video, across moving image, across installation, uh, even performance a bit, uh, if I'm not mistaken. So I will sort of, pass it over to you now and yeah I'll, I'll have a lot of questions and and uh, discussion points that we can hopefully get into uh, by the end of your talk but yeah thank you again for inviting me and looking forward to, to hearing what you have to say. Thank you Greg for such a wonderful introduction um, and thank you everybody else for joining us today as well I really um, appreciate you taking the time so I'm just going to jump straight in <laughs> as the best things always are And there we go. Okay. So this talk expands on themes of value, independence and patriarchy in my work. I explore these themes by homing in on labor in Nigeria. My work considers labor as a practice of independence. And I'll expand on that later, of course. So we'll focus on four films, Plateau, which is a work in progress, Red Gold, Brown Goods and Power Man. We'll touch on my rationale for their creation and expand on how these works relate to each other, as well as elaborate on these aforementioned themes. 
I'll speak for about 30 minutes and also share images and short, short clips of the work. The title of this talk, Yielding to Resilience, is really inspired by the subjects that I feature. I focus on labor in the context of Nigeria because it's ubiquitous in such a developing country. Despite the most hostile conditions, workers take a lot of pride in striving to maintain a sense of independence, cultivating livelihoods to provide consistency and a steady income stream, no matter the amount. When we speak about yielding, we can imagine a softness, a malleability and adaptability. And of course, the double meaning of the world of the word also implies to reap what one sows to generate, even in abundance, perhaps under limited resources. I think that's what I'm, I'm really interested in, um, this balance of strength and flexibility, almost like an elastic band that's, that's retreating and, and expanding. If we touch on the notion of independence, for instance, Nigeria's independence from Great Britain in the early 60s, value comes into play, not only the value of one's resources, but actually self-worth, self-governance. And my work seeks to discover a sense of autonomy and relay this innate spirit of serenity of the subjects that I feature. Over the years, I've featured farmers, butchers, sand merchants, sawmills. I know this has been on my part um, towards an understanding of how these practices might enable people to be independent within Nigeria's precarious social and, and, and economical systems. Curiously, I've also noticed that I'm typically drawn to male subjects. I'm really interested in discovering vulnerabilities in the social construct of masculinity and also patriarchal systems, which is quite central to Nigerian and West African culture. I include West Africa because I'm currently expanding my reach beyond Nigeria, such as the feature film Salt Mine that I'm currently developing here at the Institute, which is set in Dakar in Senegal, and I'll touch on that at the end. Okay, so as I mentioned, Plateau is a work in progress. It's a project that looks closely at tin mining in Jos Plateau State in Nigeria. It focuses on a small group of undocumented tin miners and explores the social economic complications of their activities the effects of the environment and their drive for undertaking this work. So just to give you some background on the project, um, around the time of the British occupation of Nigeria, um, tin mining was discovered in Jos. Well, it was actually um, an activity that took, that took place um, before that. So around about 900 BC, um, the people of Jos Plateau State were um, extracting tin for, for their own personal gain. But then when the British came in, it, things really amped amped up. So Plateau State is in the Middle Belt region of Nigeria, which heads towards the north of Nigeria. Um, so during colonial times, heavy mining activities took place to such an extent that the region's usually, you know, flat landscape is now peppered with man-made hills, which are excavation mounds, essentially. When the British left, lots of, a lot of resources supporting sectors such as the mining industry were dismantled. And, and once crude oil was discovered around the time of Nigeria's independence, a lot of other se sectors such as agriculture and mining fell by the wayside. So you had workers who were making a living, okay, albeit under circumstances that they didn't entirely understand the implications of. For instance, the damage to the land, um, such as man-made dams, but they were now no longer able to continue without the right equipment or the general know-how. In Plateau State, people continued mining without, without proper systems in place. And what you have today is a totally destructed landscape, a uh, totally destructed ecosystem, and a very precarious situation for miners. Um, there have been many, many de deaths. But what's really important for me to relay is, is not only um, the context for this destruction, but to highlight a sense of reclamation. These workers feel that they're claiming back their land, filling in the, in the gaps that were left behind, literally in this case, filling the earth and returning man-made hills back into the ground, but also reclaiming their independence as indigenous of the area. They realized that at some point they gave their power away. They gave their land away and they're claiming it back in the best way they understand. 
So Plato is commissioned by Fondazione in Between Art and Film for the project A Foreign Language, which is curated by Leonardo Bugazzi, Alessandro Robertini, and Paola Ugolini. There are two versions, there's a single channel version for cinema and a two channel version for installations. The single channel version will screen in September um, with Fondazione in between art film and the two channel version will screen at Vienna Succession in July and in Hamburg later on in November. And um, the installations will be supported by a series of sculptures. I'm now going to um, show you an excerpt of about five minutes um, there'll be a few publications planned around these, this work um, this year, such as Open Shields, um, which goes hand in hand with the Vienna show, um, and it will have a contribution by Erica Balsam. This book will feature research images and will give insight into the process of imagining the work. So I'm just going to show you um, a clip, hopefully this works. <laughs> very important related yep Devil room, yeah, candy, yeah, yeah, rara, you are, you cover. Get a hotel, yep, you can have we, you share, you bear us. Get a hotel, ille, who would a, you bear us. A queer raga, you be a serious, rare raga, you be a serious. Cadet said, get a ho, yere, you yep, zonku, tinta, vonkutia. Down, who what did you hope on say, you will, you serious. Nehenuna, we urum, Kakora re do yum, do room, urum, as a cure, sugo, urum, as a cure, ray. Kadaho, surum, I am mama, Icarara, Kadaho, child of Fuga, Kahotiga, Kaze, Rayua, ye day as you were, Dagui. Dagui are known, ye retodia, are you coga, mano de urum, I say, Kadaho, you room, young amo. You will plateau, because you have a guard. I did J. Day, the Urumase, Urumi, Adara, Rayame, Urivog Niri, and the Yavog Niri.
Okay. So, this spirit of independence becomes a philosophy for living and is reflected in earlier work, Red Gold, which looks at a group of farmers in Adoekiti in southwestern Nigeria. There is a feeling of these farmers just getting on with it. They found a niche to make a living, their steadfast resourcefulness under very unfavorable conditions. These farmers work independently to produce palm oil in Akiti, Western, southwestern Nigeria, as I mentioned before. They lease the land from a prince whose family have ruled the area for generations. This is not going as smoothly as I'd like. <laughs> there we go. Um, Nigeria was the biggest producer and exporter of palm oil before its independence in the 1960s. Again, when crude oil was discovered, the sector was abandoned and farmers were forgotten. The Nigerian government promotes renewed support for the agricultural industry, but this has never really transpired in a way that makes a tangible difference. These farmers work tremendously and are proudly self-sufficient. So Red Gold is a two-channel presentation. One aspect portrays the farmers while the other, the prince, Mr. Shesan, which you see here. Um, Red Gold reflects some notions of independence and value within this agricultural um, history. So here is um, a presentation that I showed um, at the Biennale of, of movement images um, in Geneva about five years ago. And I'm just gonna show you now also a very short clip of the work. It's about 20 minutes in total, but I'll show you just a few minutes so you get um, a feel for it. I need you to do what I need to do. Need you to do what I need. So you can't really hear it, but um, the prince he's talking about how the land has stayed in his family for generations. Um, when I filmed this work, I stayed with them for about um a week, and I really got to understand where they where, where they were coming from, what their philosophy philosophy for living is, and um, I came away with a huge great deal of respect for them.
Okay. So just going back to the world to the word yielding, um, red gold is it's really a work that embodies this uh, this word. You know, yielding not only in the sense of um, you know this imagery that I brought up at the beginning of the talk of of you know bending and and resisting and um, like an elastic band, but also um, an abundance. So they they work with palm oil, they work with a palm fruit, and um, they do so in such a sustainable way because their aim is really to preserve the land and to ensure that it's able to be passed down, passed down to generationally. Um, and um, so that, yeah, so it's very much a very hands-on practice and um, very rudimentary. Um, but again, yeah, touches really nicely on this, on this word, yielding. So I regard independence as a practice because it feels habitual almost like a way of life, um, which brings me really nicely to Emeka, the subject of a film I made last year um, titled Brown Goods. So Brown Goods um, is the first film that I've produced in Europe and um, touches on the story of Emeka, who's a Nigerian migrant living in Hamburg. Um, having arrived in Hamburg, I was really keen to find an opening um, a way to relate to the city, so I started researching. And you know, as a port city, looking at the history of trade between Hamburg and other Nigerian ports, such as Lagos, um, I was really drawn into the area around, um, around the port. And I found Emeka on one of my research trips um, in Rothenburgsort, which is a street near the ports of, of, of Hamburg, um, where African migrant workers provide labor to people wishing to export goods. Um, so Emeka's got humanitarian status, having traveled through Libya and Lampedusa, he left Nigeria looking for a better way to earn a living, basically, an economic um, migrant. Um, bizarrely, the search for a better life in Europe depends on African money. It's the hand that feeds him. West African exporters come all the way to Hamburg um, to transport goods such as cars, secondhand cars, fridges, and so on to mattress um, to, to Africa, aided by the labor of migrant workers like Emeka. Um, but the reason why Emeka struck me is because he takes a lot of pride in, in, in his independence. Um, it's important to him that he's self-sufficient and he adds value to the economy that he profits from. He has a registered company in Italy where he pays taxes every year and he's very proud of that. So I created this work, it's about 12 minutes um, in, in a running length, um, and here's it being shown in Hamburg early last year. Um, and I showed this work um, with a series of sculptures. Um, and I really regard um, showing sculptures or drawings or whatever it is alongside a moving image work as an extension of the moving image work as a kind of a gesture, an extended gesture. Um, these sculptures present the simplicity of the ready-made. Um, they're very elegant and um, their value really boils down to context, somehow Emeka's story in reverse. So I made these sculptures from found automobile parts and I, was very curious about what placing them in a different context would do to their value. And I just thought, well, if I place them in an art world context, that, that will increase their value immediately. Um, and I just found that super, super interesting. Um, so yeah, Emeka's story in reverse, his value and work as a Nigerian man in, in Europe, um, making the most of the restrictions that he's faced with. Um, Emeka is outwardly very strong, but what I took away from him um, was a certain vulnerability of not entirely knowing. Um, being adaptable enough to, to, to ship shape, uh, to shape shift, sorry, in order to try to thrive. I'm just gonna show you um, again, another excerpt of the film. It's about three or so minutes long.
Anybody that comes to me today into Bistras, as far as you are in Nigeria, will position you. The first one will ask you, where are you from? Then you will tell us you are from Edo State. Okay, you are from Edo State. See your people. Go and meet your people. This one is Edo. This one is Edo. Then when you are Igbo, you are from my own tribe. We will position you and tell you what we are doing. Before two, three months, you are into the system. You can feed yourself without even asking anybody to give you money. If we are four Africans here now, you see, like in this Bistraza, we Nigerians, these people, they don't give us work. The whites here that owns all these properties here, they don't call us for any job because they say Nigeria has scammers, that we are criminal. But they prefer calling a Burkina Faso because do you know why they call Burkina Faso? An Afghanistan man can come now and dig a pit and tell me a Nigerian man to jump into the pit. I will ask him, why do you want me to jump into this pit? For what reason? You jump in first. But they can call a Burkina Faso man and say, a Burkina Faso, come into this pit. A Burkina Faso man will not even ask, why do you want me to come into this pit? A Burkina Faso man will jump into this pit. They think you are a fool. They think maybe even in Africa, you don't even have a home. They think in Africa, we Africans here, they think we sleep in the tree. They even value their sleep as more than a black man. They don't know we even have what, what is even more than what they have in their country. At times, if you are not lucky, they can kill you secretly. So, moving on to the next work, Power Man. Um, as Greg mentioned at the beginning, when I started making films, um, I don't know, about 10 years ago, over 10 years ago, I started off with these really... Um, yeah, I was really keen um, to, to explore film in an almost spatial way. So I started off by making these mechanisms that I would, they, they, they came from a practice of performance where I would attach cameras to my body. And so the, the mechanisms became a kind of um, an extension of that. Um, and I would build these devices and put my camera in them and they would, um, yeah, the, 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 the ensuing image afterwards would be very visceral, quite physical. Um, and as time went on, um, I didn't want to make those devices just for the sake of making those devices. Um, um, things evolved, you know, my interests evolved um, and my, my practice also naturally evolved. And I started, um, I guess I'm always still using devices, um, but it, they've just become a little bit more sophisticated. And in Power Man, the device here is the light. Um, so Power Man is a work that homes in on notions of masculinity. Um, and its social construct in a patriarchal society like Nigeria. The work features two men who are local area boys, um, in other words, local gang members who have to defend their street cred every day. So what you have here is you have two screens, it's a two-channel two work. Two young men perform tasks and they're shown simultaneously. One shadow boxes. Um, and you never, yeah, you never see his opponent and the other relentlessly chops, um, chops something that you never see. In this work, I'm interested in the expectations we place on others in order, in order to read a work. So you can imagine encountering this work in a room. Um, you walk in and um, you encounter, encounter it very largely projected on two screens. Um, and there is really no explanation. You just see two black men, um, getting on with particular tasks and breathing heavily and panting um, and you have dark skin receding into darkness um, and the, the lack of the light intensifying the image and like I, I said about the um, the mechanisms that I would make the work is very much very very visceral although the men portray typically masculine tasks um, in the work there is an inherent vulnerability and you get a sense of a kind of a show of power and the outcome is something that's quite affected. Um, the term power man is a street slang for a strong and a fierce young man. Um, here's the work installed um, in Leipzig about two years ago um, for um, the Ars Fever Prize. 
yeah, when the work is installed, like I mentioned, it's designed to, to feel quite immersive. So it's quite physical. Um, and whether this is through sound um, or whether it's projected onto screens that feel almost weightless, um, when you encounter the work, you are enveloped in resounding thuds and panting and you can almost sense the heat or, or feel the sweat. So I'm gonna show you um, a very short, I think it's a one minute clip because the work itself is only five minutes. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> something a bit more lighter now. Um, so I'm gonna finish off this talk, um, just explaining the project that I'm currently developing here at the Institute. Um, it's, a, it's a feature film, so I'm writing a script here. And these are some illustrations that I made um, a couple of years ago while I was in residency in the South, in the south of Germany, where I, started, um, where I started imagining the work and imagining what it would look and feel like. I should mention actually that I started off um, before I became a filmmaker, I started off as a painter. And um, so drawing and painting is something that comes very, very, it's, you know, very, very naturally to me. But of course I haven't, haven't done it in a really long time before these illustrations. So it was really, really lovely to um, slip back into that again and to relearn what I started off doing. So the story really is in um, development um, and it's, it's changing, but the, the main skeleton is, is that um, salt mine is, it tells a story of, of Jemba. He's a young and tenacious salt miner who dreams of escaping the monotony of labor to a new life in Hamburg. He's forced to decide between staying in Dakar and continuing to contribute to his co country's economy, albeit in a small but yet noble way or risk everything he knows to travel illegally to Hamburg to find his missing brother. So I traveled to Dakar um, at the end of last year. I was quite lucky really and managed to slip out. <laughs> um, and about the same time that I made, um, that I filmed Plateau last year, I, I also managed to, to hop over to um, Dakar. I say hop over, but it was quite a painful 12 hour flight, but we won't go into that. <laughs> Um, and um, I started researching the work and just taking some pictures, um, some images, and just getting a feel for what I wanted to relay, um, relay in the work. So I should say that um, the image to the left, sorry, to the right is um, Lac Rose, which is where the film is set. And Lac Rose really is how the story began for me. I, I went to Senegal about five years ago and discovered this really amazing site where they um, mine salt. Um, and that really became the basis for me for the film. Um, and I decided to set the story there. So I went back and, um, and researched, interviewed people and so on, met with academics and talked to workers and really wanted to gain um, a very strong political understanding and social understanding of the country as well. Um, and um, last month when things sort of really kicked off in, in, in Senegal, you know, with the protests and stuff, and um, I won't go into too many politics, but it, the story for me um, felt very apt, um, felt, felt at the right moment to be developing um, a work like this. So while I'm here at Columbia, um, I hope to finish um, writing the script. Um, and then, you know, hopefully in the next year or two, um, make the work, which would be really, really very exciting. So yeah, that's me, <laughs> that's the end of the talk. So I'm gonna um, head back in with, um, with Greg and we're gonna take your, take your questions and hopefully answer them. <laughs> yes, we will. Thank you for the presentation. <laughs> um, a few things that I wanted to ask you, I guess, before we, we get into our discussion or this is part of the discussion. Yeah. You mentioned something previously about painting uh, when, when you showed some of your, your, your work. And I'm curious to know, what was that moment 
when you realized or thought, you know what, I want to move from painting to video. I want, I want to deal with the moving image because it's going to allow me to do this or because I see this in the form or because this inspired me. What was that moment or that passage like for you between disciplines? You know, I spent my time in art school. I remember making one video in art school, um, but I spent the majority of my time painting and it was quite a labored process. Um, and when I left art school, I just, I was quite impatient. I wanted to say things and say them quickly. And video was just, I could just pick up the camera and just attach it to myself and move, you know, perform or whatever. And, and it just felt very instant. I didn't even know anything technically. I'm completely self-taught. I edit all my films and I'm completely self-taught. But I didn't really care about um, the technical aspect of it. I just wanted to relate. I had a sense of a very strong urgency that I just wanted to communicate what I wanted to say and do so quickly and just have it be out there in the world, you know? Um, and so it was because of that that I, um, I just switched over and I didn't really think about it. It just felt, just felt like a natural progression. Yeah. And then maybe let's cut all the way to the present. Now you're developing a feature length film. Um, when, we, when you sort of consider some of the examples of, of your work that you introduced us to, you know, mostly short length or medium length work, often rendered in dual channel installations for certain dispositifs, we can say, and in other cases, single channel for, for others. So I would be curious to know at this point in your career and, and the work that you're doing, what's the impulse or the, 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 the instinct to now, I need to go wider, I need a bigger canvas, at least bigger in terms of the temporality of your work? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, I should start off by saying that, you know, genres, whether it's documentary or whatever, experimental, they don't really interest me. I guess it's just for people to frame my work in a certain way so that they can understand it. And so the term feature length really deep down doesn't really mean anything to me. Um, I only use it because it makes sense to people. Um, for me, it's just an expanse. You know what I mean? It's a longer space to say what I want to say. It's a, it's a it's luxurious, it's a, it's, it's a luxury of, of having enough time and space to really unfold and unfurl a story. Um, yep. So really that's what that is for me, you know? Um, and so whatever <laughs> box that people want to attach or, or tick with that, it doesn't really make a difference to me. It's just about having that luxury of, of you know, of space and time and length and, and all of that. Yeah, that's fine. Let's talk a little bit more about aesthetics. Um, there's something that I noticed in your work that I really like, and in some cases we see it in the title of the work, in some cases we see it in the actual body of the work, in some cases both. I'm thinking about your use of color. Um, you have films obviously like Red Gold, uh, Brown Goods, this is sort of one of your recurring motifs. And then when I think of some of your earlier works, you know, I think that my favorite of yours is, is King of Boys and uh, the, the wonderful red filter that you use to sort of structure, but also fracture vision in that film. We'll talk about devices in a moment, but I'm also thinking about Makoko Sawmill with the beautiful light blue planks that also sort of structure, engage the visuals of the film. I can think about Power Man in terms of the deep black and the different shades of black mm -hmm. and, and the way the, the light plays with that black. Um, all of your work has some sort of painterly, colorful quality. Can you maybe talk about color as a motif, but also as, as a material, as, as, as a form in your work? Yeah, you know, I spoke about devices and um, sort of making that switch over to something that feels a little bit more sophisticated, like in Power Man, the, the use of light. And I should really mention, in just a trade secret here, Power Man was actually shot with, the, with a burner, with a light from a mobile phone. So again, I had that urgency and just use whatever materials that I had at the time. But I think, you know, the speed and of color is something that's innate in me. It's, it's, it's not something that I consciously think about, except perhaps in, 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 um, in King of Boys and Makoko Sawmill, um, but it's just something that's, it's an impulse almost, you know? Um, but with King of Boys, I mean, that happened quite naturally I guess I found this container in, in Amsterdam on the streets and then I made this device and I took it and used it there in Lagos and I just wanted I was just really curious to see what um what a tint a red tint could do to the image what that would bring how that would impart um 
story, you know. Um, and then with 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 Makako sawmill, I was very specific about the exact shade of blue. I don't know, maybe I had a dream or something. I don't know. I just knew that it had to be this specific tone. So I went and I bought the paint, and then I took it with me again to, to Lagos, and then made the mechanism. So sometimes I will just be struck with an impulse, and and then that's where that will the work will come from, all the ideas come from. Yep, and let's talk more about these devices. So you mentioned the burner phone, you mentioned this um, this red, this sort of cut or, or disassembled red plastic jug or container. Uh, we have the wooden planks in, in Makoko Sawmill and Lego Sand Merchants. We have this wonderful wooden wheel that you sort of sculpted and literally sort of animated the camera with, animated the video with. Um, devices, yeah, that's another strong characteristic in your work. As you say, now the devices, I wouldn't say that they're more, they're more advanced or, or, or even more hidden. Um, I would say maybe that they're just, you're just using them in different ways, but devices, you know, your body as a device. Yeah. Um, what is it with these, these devices and it, this sort of just explosion of, of creativity that, that allows you to, to consider what they are and how they can sort of affect your work? You know, it comes from many things, but, um, you know, around the same time that I was studying painting, I was also studying um, uh, uh, performance. And so I really came from that performative space, right? And so, yeah, it started off with my body as a device, it started off with me attaching cameras to my body or making, um, devices specifically with cameras attached to them that I could use in performances and then growing on from there. Um, but what was the other end of your question? Sorry, something very interesting. I had an answer. Yeah, no, just thinking of, of the way these devices, how just the creativity, the inventiveness and, and the way that you, you can take a, a, an object, a, a ready-made object and, and use it to sort of amplify to, to, to structure and, and transform your work. So we were talking about the phones and, and the wooden planks, also the, the, the red container, the mm -hmm. cut red container. And, um, and then, con, you know, currently the, the devices that you use, um, it could be said that maybe they're a bit more hidden, they're maybe not so explicit, but they're shifting, right? Just like your work is, is transforming. Mm -hmm. um, and, and growing, so you're just using devices in, in different ways. Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah, definitely. I mean, like like in the film that I'm developing now with Plateau, um, the device almost feels here for me. Um, I'm using this uh, a reiteration of, of the cactus throughout the film. And so you just, you're met with this very gentle movement in and out of cactuses or whatever. So I, that kind of almost feels like a, a pace setter, like a rhythmic kind of device. Um, so I guess, yeah, I, I think in every single work that I make, I'm just expanding on, 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 on how to say something in a way that feels performative, in a way that still relates to my core interests, you know? Um, and, you know, in, in the earlier works, the devices were very much inspired by the actions that I would watch people taking. So for instance, in, um, in, in the, um, uh, I've forgotten the name of my film, how embarrassing. Can you remind me the sort, the one where... <laughs> oh, uh, Lego Sam Merchants. Lego <laughs> Sam Merchants. <laughs> where the device is going, um, going down and coming back up for air and it's, and it's, it's the, the camera is, is in this wheel that's turning and going down and you meet the ground and it lurches. You know, that really came from observing the workers who were going physically down to the bottom of this um, lagoon to, to get the sand. and. You know, they're, they're very simple, I guess, if you think about them. I don't try to overcomplicate things. I don't think, oh, how can I make something more, feel more like an artwork? It's just literally, I have an idea, let's just follow through with it. And it's the same thing with the sculptures, like what you see in Brown Goods. Um, that they are these ready-mades because that is what feels right. That's what feels appropriate. And so I just roll with it. And they're the context, the change of, you know, of how you encountered them. Um, that is really what brings the value into play and, and what really turns them into artworks, I suppose. Um, so yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think this fearlessness, this, uh, this 
um, eagerness to risk and, and to experiment and, and to sort of listen to that voice in your head that and, and sort of to let it shape the work in these devices. I think that's what, what makes your work great. Um, just that, that feel that where you're sort of jumping off into the deep end, but you, you always come back with a jewel. Maybe you can talk a little bit now about labor. Um, because this is another one of your, your structuring motifs. If we have to classify Karima Ashadu, the artist, she's very interested in labor. Um, she depicts labor, but not to romanticize labor, not to romanticize the worker or work, but somehow, and this is apparent now as we watch your career grow and we sort of see how all the pieces of the puzzle fit together, because it's very abstract in the beginning, but I think, correct me if I'm wrong, the way you deal with labor or your interest in labor is the effects on the world, like literally the effect on the landscape, right? You're dealing with that in your recent work, the traces that labor leaves on the landscape, but also sort of those, those implicit traces uh, that labor leaves in, in the trade of goods and in some cases, the trade of people, right? So maybe talk a little bit about, about labor and, and sort of what what attracts you to this, this topic and, and investigating it with your work? You know, like the way that I was drawn into making my devices, it, it was something that I didn't really think about, overthink when I, when I first started making works um, centered around labor. Obviously as the work has evolved, um, I've questioned my practice and questioned why I'm interested in the things that I'm interested in, why I make the work that I do. Um, and it really touches on on the title of this talk, you know, uh, you know, labor is a kind of a practice of independence. And that's really how I look at, um, at, at labor. Like I said, I'm not romanticizing labor. I'm not um, making it less than what it is. Um, but it really isn't about that for me. It's, it's not really about, oh, look at these poor people doing this very hard work. It's, just, it's, it's an acceptance of what is you know, allowing what is, placing no judgment on what is. Um, and then just being able to go in, accept that for what it is and say, well, actually, what can I take from these? What can I learn from these people? Okay, they are, they are, you know, um, they are laboring away. Um, like I said, it's, a, it's, an, it's almost a lifestyle because they are trying to be independent. They want to provide for themselves, provide for their family stand on their own two feet. And literally, Emeka says this, he wants to stand on his own two feet. He doesn't want to feed off the government. He wants to make his own way. And that's what they're doing. And I have such a strong admiration for that. I mean, how mind blowing is that, right? So how dare I go in there with, with my judgments and take, it, take, take, it, take away anything else than what I'm presented with? I don't know whether you remember my time at the Flaherty Seminar um, a few years ago, Greg, right? And it was very difficult for people to wrap their heads, their heads around that I was going in and I was saying, well, okay, there is this theme of labor and it's there, but I'm also gonna bring in color. I'm also gonna bring in sound, rhythm. I'm gonna see what that does when I put a mechanism there. I'm gonna see how I can explore the space between the camera and the subjects. And then labor just kind of really, in a sense, I guess, took a bit of a back seat. Um, and people were outraged because they wanted that to sit at the forefront. Um, and, you know, when you see black bodies laboring away on the screen, it, I guess it, it can bring up certain discomforts. But for me, the, the racial part of it is not the main focus for me, you know? Um, yep. I can talk about this for a very long time. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, and I remember that, uh, that seminar, of course, because that we had you at that moment in a very and a documentary heavy sort of context. And, and people there were eager to sort of ascribe that ideology of, of the genre uh, upon you and your work. And, and they were sort of, they were struggling with that. I'm glad they struggled. They deserved a struggle because they needed to look at your work with a broader focus, but also it sort of, it connects to your hesitancy about the word documentary. Um, you and other artists like you have noticed don't necessarily uh, don't feel an affinity to that word, and that word could limit you and your work in, in a number of ways that you aren't comfortable with. And I totally agree with that also, and, and understand that and respect that. There's one thing that you said that I'm so glad you reminded me of, because I want to mention it before we open it up to questions. I know we're running short on time. Independence. Yeah. Uh, independence as practice. Oh, I love that. Absolutely. 
Um, tell us a little bit more about the practice of independence as an artist, as a working artist, uh, as a practicing artist. Talk a little bit more about that. I mean, it's like you read my mind, Greg. Um, that's really where my interest in independence comes from. It's, it's from me, it's from what I've had to do to get to where I am, what I still do um, every day to get to where I am. And um, I started off like a dog with a bone in my teeth. I just had ideas, I had very little money and I just used my resources in the best way that I could in an effort to get myself to a place where I you know, was self, am self-sufficient, where I call the shots, right? Where um, I can get myself to a certain basis where I can just, if I have an idea and I wanna make it work, I can just go off and do that. Um, and so that's really where that, that, that independence comes from. It's about ensuring that I can be as self-sufficient as possible um, in order to have no restrictions being placed on the way that I make my work and to ensure that I, that the work stays very close to, of course the work um, is created to engage with, for me to engage with other people for an audience, but I essentially also make the work for myself, you know? It comes very um, uh, almost selfishly from wanting to satisfy um, a question that I might have and trying to find an answer. So yeah, it, it, it weaves very much into my practice as, as an artist, very, very much. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for expanding on that. I think I've asked enough questions. I should leave the opportunity for people in the audience um, forgive me with my slowness using Zoom. I'm on a mobile phone, so I have to, to try to check and see who's raising their hand and, and how to bring you up. But feel free to, uh, to raise your hand or I guess put your question either in the chat or, or the Q&A section. Hi, Karima. I raised my hand, so this is Lamia. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, thank you for this great presentation. It was really amazing to see your work. Thank um, you. I have several questions. Um, um, one is, um, I really love the painting and I'm, I'm surprised because I didn't, I mean, I didn't know at all this, uh, this work. So I, I was wondering, like, going back to painting after such a long time, uh, how, do you think it will inform or transform or change um, your way of filming? Um, because you're, you're not just the, the painting being an extension or the, the artwork that completes the film, but actually inform the film in different ways or even be integrated um, in the film. That's the first question. I'll put them all together so you can answer them the way you want. Uh, the second one is when one speak of labor and film, I can only think about Harun Farouki and how he's really done some really amazing work uh, filming uh, labor at work. And um, if that was an influence in how, um, and how, um, if, it, if it is. Um, and the third one is also on the notion of independence, which I really like how you phrase it, but also uh, is still remains, uh, I mean, contains some kind of mystery because um, you, you presented us characters and their individualities, um, I mean, versus, um, I mean, who chose, who chose a certain kind of independence. And of course, uh, when, you, when you see uh, the mining, you can only think about the relationship to trade and colonialism. And, and um, I was wondering if, if within the film, because you've only shown excerpt, do you go on um, into investigating the root of trade and uh, relation to cooperation and where are they questioning where, the, where, the, where these exports are going and who's benefiting from, these, uh, uh, from the mining and uh, basically the, the, chain of, uh, the chain of trade that, that maybe uh, um, is also uh, the route for independence uh, or reappropriating the richnesses that um, that that may that are that are the countries which richnesses versus cooperation that comes from foreign countries that may have put their hand on these resources. Okay, I was making notes. <laughs> um, <laughs> on to the first one on painting. Um, that's a really actually 
quite a lovely question. Um, uh, and you know, possibly, yes, I'm, I'm in this place where I hope to stay, where I'm very open. I'm very open to, um, to being led down, um, you know, certain paths. So in terms of painting, that just kind of came organically. I noticed that I missed it. There was something about it that I really missed. And I just, I just thought, oh, what if I wish I could go back to painting. And I was like, well, why can't I? And I started doing these drawings and it just came about. So I'm very interested in developing my technique again and relearning that and seeing whether, and seeing how that, you know, how that moves and what surfaces I'll even paint on, whether I will make sculptural works and paint on those. Um, and I think inevitably, I think things go hand in hand. I think in some way they will, the painting will in some way inform, inform the filming, but I'm of course not sure how that will transpire yet. Um, it's, a, it's a little bit like the sculptures that I make um, alongside them, even though they are gestures of the work and extensions of, of the moving image work, they're also very much independent works, right? Um, so yeah, they, they influence, like I say, it all goes hand in hand. In terms of um, filmmakers, yes, of course I'm familiar with Haroon Faruqi's work. Um, the last time I saw something of his was at the Venice Biennale um, several years ago. Um, but in a funny way, although I watch films, I'm not really influenced by other, other um, video artists. So I watch, I watch a, a whole bunch of things. Um, but really, I like, for instance, I watched Elizabeth Price the other day, um, the Woolworth Squire, and I loved the way that she uses rhythmic tone in, in that work. Um, and so I take away something from that, the way that she uses sound, for instance. Um, so yeah, I'm not really influenced by other, other filmmakers, really. Um, but of course, I appreciate um, the breadth of work that's out there and, and the context that I, I sit, my work sits in, in that. Um, in terms of independence, um, investigating the route of trade, I kind of feel like my interests lead me to where they lead me. I'm not really very um, interested in being overtly political or uh, overtly um, dictatorial, I guess, in terms of relaying the history in a very literal way. But do the subjects know about um, what's going on? Of course they do. I mean, I was um, completely blown away when I was doing my research in Joss and I spoke to, I interviewed people and um, they were furious um, that their ancestors had given their land away without really knowing what was going on. And, and now that they understand, you know, the trade lines and how countries like Great Britain, I mean, they knew such amazing facts. They were like telling me how Liverpool was made by the tin that was from Joss Plateau and so on and so forth. And they knew certain um, houses or certain, um, uh, um, buildings that have been built from the tin from Nigeria. So they're quite well informed, but of course it, it, it's a little bit too late for them, you know? Um, and so, yeah, or, or when I when I speak to somebody like Emeka, um, of course he knows, um, you know, what part his labor plays now and the history of that trade um, between, between Germany and Nigeria and specifically Hamburg and Nigeria. So they're very well informed. Um, but in the way that I, I'm talking too much here, in the way that I, <laughs> that I um, present my ideas and present my findings or whatever it is I'm trying to say, I'm very conscious of not feeding the audience, um, of leaving enough room, saying what I want to say and then stepping back and allowing enough space for the audience to come in and take away something and impart a little bit something, you know, of their, their, own, um, their own perspectives. If that answers your question, I hope. Yes, thank you. Yes, it does. It does. Yes. Yeah, thank you for the question. And can we take another one? Would someone like to raise their hand or drop something in the chat, maybe? If not, I can always ask more, even though we're running out of time. So, yeah, um, you know, thinking of Faraki and, and sort of the, the, the documentary impulse and, and, and labor and, and all these things, I, yeah, I do think you're sort of charting your own path and, and going in, in your own direction, uh, which I think is really important. 
but yeah i you know it's always interesting to to hear you know who artists are are, are watching and what sort of what sort of conversations that they're sort of in the stream of, whether sort of explicitly or, or implicitly. Um, so that's always nice to know. But yeah, I, th I think your work is, is very singular and I'm really curious to see where it takes you next because we, you know, we've talked about uh, sculpture and, and sort of the use of, of the ready-made as a concept, as an actual object. We talked about the the painting. Uh, the paintings are beautiful. There's kind of a whole transmedia sort of narrative that's starting to flow through your work. When I think of that that red um, the the red container that you use in King of Boys, which I love so much, which again seems sort of very abstract and and very surprising and unexpected at first glance. When you watch a video like Brown Goods, it all makes sense, right? It all comes back. Sort of, we see the circular, we see that triangle trade of objects, right? Things starting in one place, ending up in another, and who's sort of implicated in in that movement of 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 goods and 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 peoples, and how a thing from from one setting can have a totally different context when it's moved. Whether it's the tin from Joss that ends up in Liverpool and literally builds the homes that keeps people warm and, and keeps them alive or whether it be the plastic container from Amsterdam that finds its way somehow back to to the motherland right and sort of has an effect and in, in, in a new way of allowing us to see things um, a, a new way to understand how things are connected and you do leave that space for the viewer which is also something that I appreciate you allow us also to sort of sketch and and, and sort of assemble our own devices so that's also one of the things that I really appreciate that I wanted to mention. I think there's something in the chat, just to quickly look again, sorry, I'm on mobile. No, maybe I can, maybe I can look, let's see. Yeah, it's a question from Annette Sudbeck. Can you tell us more how you find and meet your protagonists and how your encounters influence the production? Yeah, I mean, something that I, um, I'm obsessed with doing is I, I stare at everybody, I'm, I'm always absorbing and that's how I get a lot of my ideas as well. I have like a, a mental archive and it could literally be the way someone makes a gesture or a look on their face or just something very slight and I'll tuck it away and I, I will, I'll have a moment of deja vu when I'm filming something and I'll, I'll reiterate that, right? So I'm very, very much influenced by people. I think that's a huge source of where I get my ideas. Um, and in terms of how I meet my subjects, um, it really depends. But I, I like for instance, with Brown Goods, I was literally just wandering around Hamburg. And um, I mean, with this specific area, Bilstrasse, where, um, where I met Emeka, I noticed it one day when I was coming in on a train from the Hauptbahnhof and I, I looked down and I saw this area and I went off, researched it on my map and I just went there the next day. I started just walking around talking to people right I'm a great believer that someone is always willing to help me <laughs> so I started talking to people and being led to the next person and before I knew it I had met Emeka and we started talking um, we lost contact but I was put back in touch with him again and then we we we, um, we worked together and I asked him at one point Emeka why are you so open to me why are you telling me your story don't you care where it ends up and he said to me, he, he's, he's so incredibly smart and insightful. And he said to me, I'm well read, like I'm not stupid. I, I regard you as a journalist and I have a story to tell and it's important that my story's out there. Everyone wants to, to, to talk about their story, right? <laughs> I was like, yeah. So, um, I mean, he blew me away with that. Um, and and with, with the work like, um, like a Plateau, I, I knew that tin mining was going on in Joss Plateau State. I did some research very rudimentary before I went and I literally just will just buy a ticket and go somewhere and start talking to people. And, and then one person will lead me onto another person. So I'm very curious and very adventurous that way. Um, and and that's, how, that's how it goes really. Yep, thank you very much for that. And I would actually like to give the final question to Mark uh, who will also, take us out of this session because we're running up on our, our time, but I just in advance to say thank you, Karima, and, and also thank you, Mark, 
uh, for the invitation, for, for the beautiful work, for the beautiful talk, but, but feel free, Mark, I know you have something that you'd like to ask. I'm please. sorry, I can't, I, can't, I can't resist because there's so much to talk about. Um, but you said one thing that came up and, and that was a wonderful discussion. Thank you, Bo, thank you, Greg. And Karima, um, you started saying something in the discussion about, about documentary and about why we, what you do, you don't really particularly like the label documentary. And I was thinking back to my initial um, appreciation of your, of your work and, uh, and, uh, and qualities about it that struck me as very special, uh, qualities of, of visual qualities, but also qualities of the sound. Um, and so I wondered if you could just say a little more to us about what, what's wrong with documentary, if one wants to put it that way, or what are the limits, what are your thoughts about, about this thing documentary now uh, in relation to your own practice? I, I, I would be interested, I think a lot of people would be interested in that. You know what it is, it's, it's not that there's anything wrong with anything, I don't think there is, every, every, I can't, yeah, look at it like that, but for me, the word documentary implies um, a sort of pass, like something that's maybe passive almost in a way, which I have a problem with, I guess. Um, and also maybe it doesn't really come across. And I guess it, you know, that's maybe the beauty of the work that I make is that I direct a huge part of it and that's mixed in with observation. Um, sometimes it's very internet intentional. Somebody might turn and, and confront the camera with a gaze. Um, or I might, you know, I'll just direct them throughout whenever I feel like it. Um, and so because of that, I, I just kind of feel like, um, well, I know that it's, 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 it's this very fine balance of creating enough space for things to unfold as they want to unfold, but then being able to go in there and fine tune it and tweak it to say exactly what I want to say. So yeah. for me, documentary doesn't really ring true, but of course, if somebody wants to call my work documentary, I'm not gonna sit there and start defending it, frankly, because I can't really be bothered, but I, I know what it, it is I'm trying to say and what I wanna say, so it doesn't really, yeah. Make so that, that's very helpful. I mean, it's very helpful to think about what these labels do and do not impose yeah. on the work these days. Yeah. Um, well, look, I want to thank you both very, very, very much. Greg Duhur for your wonderful uh, discussion and Karima for, for showing us your work and talking to us about your work. Um, I just want to remind everybody that we will uh, have the next rendezvous with Anouk Arud Pragasam in two weeks time. Hope you can join us for that. But I don't think we will quickly forget those fantastic images of yours, Karima. And uh, uh, I, I wish you all productivity in the coming weeks and months as you continue. I can't wait, wait to see what happens to Salt Mine. So thank you everybody for joining us. And Greg, Karima, thank you so, so much for this wonderful event. Thank, thank you. you. Bye -bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Greg. Thank you, Mark. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.